Okay, um, thank you. I'm uh, Rich Shin. I'm from Hardwick, Massachusetts, and I've been variously described as a zealot, uh, religious fanatic, uh, carbon cowboy. You know how they say um, everything a carpenter sees, they can hit with a hammer? Well, I think you can hit everything with a cow. That's me. <laughs> <coughs> So anyway, this is, uh, you know, I'm going to try and run you through some, uh, some ideas of what we're doing here uh, in the Northeast, if I can figure out how to advance these slides. Here we go. Okay, so, so basically what I'm going to try and do is just hit on three things. Um, 20 minutes is not a lot of time. I just did an all-day seminar, and I didn't nearly get done. So, um, but these three topics, the dire impacts of today's beef industry, and a lot of you perhaps think of, of cow as the villain, as one of the problems. I think it uh, is in the opposite is the solution. Talk about some of the benefits of grazing. And then uh, a new grazing pilot that we have uh, underway in the Northeast. Um, so here's a picture. Uh, does anybody know what that is? That's a feedlot. OK. so. Um, what you're looking at there is these are the paddocks or pens. Each one of those probably has 100 animals in it. And this is the runoff. Um, you don't have to look at that very long to say, hmm, something's wrong. But basically what this is is, is our situation. 98% of the beef in the country is raised on feedlots. And one of the huge problems is the concentration of the nutrients that are fed to the cattle that then put the nutrients into a lagoon like this. Then if the lagoon breaks, it can actually pollute the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. Let's just go on in. So here's what the feedlot looks like when you get it on in there. And some of the bad things about this industrial system, I mean, some people are worried about the humane conditions, but there's a lot more really important uh, things going on in there. And this is a long list, and I don't really have time to go into each one of them, but I will, I will jump on a couple of them. E. coli. Interestingly, when the cattle are fed grain, it creates acidosis in the rumen. One of the biggest inputs in the feedlot is, armor, is baking soda. It comes in in tractor trailers and an attempt to buffer the rumen. That creates an acid environment in the rumen, which allows acid resistance E. coli to develop. Is that a problem for us? It absolutely is. Cornell did the study where they took the cattle off grain for the last 10 days of their life and virtually eliminate acid-resistant E. coli. So why are we feeding cattle grain? That's a huge one. We can get the E. coli out of the spinach. We just have to take it out of the rumen. Um, mad cow. Now, there's another one that is a serious thing that nobody wants. Mad cow occurred because cattle were fed other ruminants. Now, if a cow dies in a field, the other cows will not go over and eat it. If you're a chicken, you might go eat it. Or if you're a pig, you might go eat it. Another cow will not eat another cow unless you grind it up and put it in their feed. So they can't, you know, the, 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 the possibilities when we're putting ingredients in, all kinds of things can come in. So many of these are issues that are important, growth hormones, antibiotics. This is the huge one, omega-6 overload. One of the things that's fascinating is that when cattle are raised on grain, we get this out of whack omega-6, omega-3 ratio. Some people say the omega-6 is good fats. I mean, the omega-3s are good fats. The omega-6 are bad fats. That's incorrect. They're both EFAs, essential fatty acids. We need them for brain function. But we need them in the right ratio. And when we feed grain, we get 10 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. And that's what gives you the heart disease and all those bad wraps that red meat has. Fascinating, when you put them on grass, you get one omega-6 to one omega-3. So you have a ratio like wild salmon, if you feed them what they're supposed to eat. <clears throat> so there's a whole bunch of these, and we'll get to a couple more of them as we go along. Um, this is part of the problem. We planted last year 97 million acres of corn. And that's what it looks like for the most part. It's uh, oxidizing carbon. And um, what is interesting is that this corn that we grow is we grow it because it's subsidized. 
We grow it because the government makes 40% of it into ethanol, 40% goes to livestock feed, cattle included, and then the balance goes to food ingredients like corn syrup, which aren't very good for us either. But the subsidy is a big reason that the corn is grown. And this last, with the price of corn uh, went sky high because of the ethanol debacle, then, then all kinds of pasture was plowed to grow more corn. And guess what? The price, price plummeted. And that's something that farmers don't understand is that cycle of the economy. But corn is huge, 97 million acres. And this is how most of it's grown. It's grown in a monoculture. It's grown with plowing, herbicides, pesticides, chemical fertilizers. And the real crime is that we destroy the soil biology in this monoculture. It's the real crime. And, and on the other hand, it's the real optimism. If we can change this, we can change it very rapidly. But, um, you know, to give you an example, um, I drove once from Pennsylvania to Illinois, and as I drove through our breadbasket, I drove along and I, it, the corn had not been planted yet. And I said, you know, something's weird. I can't really figure this out. Then it dawned on me that the median strip was green and being mowed, and the little strip on the side to the fence was green and being mowed. And our corn land, there was no green. There were no weeds. And I thought, that's incredible. If I go to Manhattan, the weeds come up through the pavement. And here's our breadbasket, and the weeds will not grow. I mean, it's obscene. And this is 97 million acres that this situation occurs. So that's the real crime of all these ingredients that are part of the industrial modality, uh, the net result being that we really, really destroy the soil biology. Uh, just to go a little sideways, this is a slide out of one of uh, Stephanie Seneff's um, talks. She's uh, from MIT. She's the one that's done a peer-reviewed study on the correlation between the agricultural chemical glyphosate, commonly, commonly known as Roundup, and its correlation to, guess what, autism, Alzheimer's, and ADD. And she's finding a direct, well, it's 0.99, it's not one but a direct correlation between the use of those chemicals and those massive health problems that we have. Now, she's just showing a correlation. She's not proving a causation, but that's a remarkably straight line uh, correlation. And she feels that if these trends continue by 2025, one in two people will be autistic. That's scary. But let's go to the alternative. The alternative is grazing ruminants. Now, the, the bovine is really this magical creature with a four-part stomach. Many people say, well, you got grass-based pork and you got grass-based chickens, but those, those species are monogastrids. They have one stomach. Just the ruminants, which include goats and sheep and cattle, have a four-part stomach. And they can take in biomass like this and work it, work it through their rumen and make phenomenal protein out of us, for us, out of a completely solar-powered system. You can do this with no inputs, other than the sun, the soil, and the bovine. So this is from a farm that I work for in North Carolina. This is what they're grazing here as a cover crop. Down there we had land that was been in tobacco and destroyed in the same way that corn land is destroyed. So we're bringing it back with cover crops. So we plant an eight-way cover crop, what they call a uh, cover crop cocktail. We take eight different species and plant them. And that's what it looks like. And that's the cattle being run through it in a very high density, we're getting tremendous rates of gain, uh, and being moved with just a single wire, a single electric fence wire. So these are the things that we can chalk up to grazing correctly. And that's huge. I mean, there's, there's grazing, and then there's grazing correctly. And it's a big, big distinction. Uh, when we do it correctly, we actually graze or we, we actually sequester tremendous amounts of carbon. Uh, we build the soil health and fertility. It saves energy tremendously and water and provides this nutrient-dense food. <coughs> so this is what we're trying to do. We are trying to mimic 
the uh, species like the buffalo in America that had the symbiotic relationship with the prairie, where um, as Jim so aptly described, they're moving in this huge herd, hundreds of thousands, and you can imagine the smell of the manure and the urine, but they move. And as they move, the ground behind them rests. So what we're doing is essentially the same thing, although we as humans are doing it, and we're using this one electric wire to do it. So we want the cattle in great density, but we want them to move, and then the real important thing is not so much the motion as the rest, getting an adequate rest period to let the grass regrow. <clears throat> so that they, but, but the whole thing is really, um, it's really not a science so much as an art. And, uh, you know, this is something that cannot be easily industrialized or McDonaldized. Some people say, well, couldn't you take 365 days, make 365 paddocks, have a gate open automatically, and you'd be all set. You don't need any people. A robot could do it. Won't work because you have to look and see, did the grass grow? Are the cattle getting what they need? Do they need a bigger paddock today, a smaller paddock? It, it absolutely is going to create a new agrarian uh, class that knows how to graze. There's some people in this room that already know how to do that. But it's going to, it, it is, it is the future. <laughs> so this is the kind of the results. And you know, we've seen so many pictures from other parts of the world. This is Massachusetts. Let's go home to Hardwick, Massachusetts. I lease the land trust, uh, land from the land trust in, in the center of Hardwick. And I, when I took over this land, it was in corn. It'd been in corn for 25 years. So it had all the worst possible chemicals. Well, this is five, four or five, five or six years later. I took some people this spring out to see the grass. One of the things we manage for is the bobolinks. So we want to let the bobolinks nest, fledge, and take off before we graze the land or mow it. So when we went out to this field, the grass was four feet tall. I mean, the grass was literally four feet tall in this field. So we climbed up in the burning platform, which is 12 feet tall, so we could look down on the grass. And I was stunned because this is my neighbor's farm. And over here, what he does is he makes hay all the time. He just mows hay. He has no cattle. It's a different management, adjacent with a stone wall. And his grass was two feet tall. He hadn't mowed it yet this season. This was July 7th or so. He hadn't got around to mowing it. So my grass is four feet tall. His is two feet tall. It's just unbelievable the, the pounds of dry matter that were created on this land versus that. Same water, same sun, all the same conditions, except totally different management. This had cattle. Uh, put through it. And when you begin to add it up, you know, we have ways of measuring how many pounds of dry matter, because that's what you have to figure out. The cow needs 3% of its body weight every day in dry matter. So you figure it out. You measure what's four feet tall, you know, how many acre inches of grass do we have, how dense is it, and it's just stunning how much dry matter is grown in four foot tall grass versus two foot tall grass. And like I say, this is done in central Massachusetts. Same, similar kind of adjoining properties. You see a lot of these pictures of the fence line. I just think this one's neat because it's right here in Massachusetts. <clears throat> the other thing is, as you go along, and, and this goes back to the correct kind of grazing, um, these pictures were taken about a week ago or a week apart in Hardwick. This is a, a, a herd of cattle on grass that's been rotationally grazed. And this is what an adjoining property looks like that has, the, where they, they put the cattle out in May and brought them in in November. So the cattle were out in this paddock the whole time. And what happens is about every four days, the, the new plant gets going. And these cattle in this field just stand there. And as soon as it grows, they go over and nip it. And that goes on all summer long. So that's, that's but this is a possibility. So, uh, but it is, it's all management. Okay, thanks. So to move on quickly, you've seen this slide before, but I just wanted to say this is um, Christine Jones, and this, this is interesting because what, there was a property in Australia where a father owned it, and when he died, it went to two sons. And each of the sons had a different management practice. The guy on the right continued in the kind of the conventional 
chemical, plowing, whatever. The guy on the left went to holistic grazing, and you can just see the difference in what, what uh, <coughs> Christine said in her findings is that uh, from four to eight inches down, they doubled the amount of core carbon. From eight to 12 inches down, they tripled the amount of carbon. And then from 12 to 16, they quadrupled the amount of carbon. Her thesis being is that when, you, when your plants are large and have a big solar collector and are collecting the, the, the carbon out of the air, doing their photosynthesis, and they put it down, the real magic happens way underground. Right up here at the surface, it's all about the same. In that litter, you have about the same amount of organic matter in both farms. And it's very much, uh, it's not permanent. It gets oxidized very quickly. But when you get that carbon down here in a, <coughs> in a soil aggregate, it becomes very stable. And this, is, this was done in 10 years. They created that 16 inches of topsoil in Australia in 10 years. So back to this, uh, you've seen this slide again. This is the real thing that happens below the soil. I like to talk about this like as a, um, uh, in terms of employees, okay? So say I have a 100 acre farm and I have one employee who weighs 200 pounds. Now below the soil, I have two tons um, or, or a ton. So essentially I have a thousand employees under the soil. I have the one employee above. Now I have to pay that person a workman's comp and wage. Now, these guys don't work for free. I mean, you have to feed them. You have to create a system where they get fed. But just think of that. The, I mean, a thousand employees down there working away. You don't even know what their names are. And they're, <laughs> they're working for you. And that's the real magic. So this is the other one. You know, glomulin. You, you heard some people talk about glomulin. That is this kind of magical little thing that makes a that is like a waxy coating around a soil aggregate that makes it stable. Guess when we discovered glomulin? 1996. <laughs> we went to space before we discovered glomulin. But this is the, this is the magic. This is, and, and this is a study that was done by the USDA that says glomulin is significantly increased by rotational grazing. So that's fascinating. So let me move on. I just got a couple minutes. Um, what we're doing in the Northeast is I have a, uh, a contract to produce 5,000 animals in the Northeast next year for a vendor. And many people are saying, well, can you do it? And I think so. What we have in the Northeast, as John was saying, is we have water, we have incredible grass, we have great grassland soils. Um, what's happening in the industrial s um, system and really in the Northeast, um, we have 310 thousand beef cattle that come out of the Northeast every year. They get aggregated by the cattle dealer and they go and they end up in the feedlot out west. 140,000 out of New England, 170,000 out of New York State. So there's this huge group of cattle in the Northeast. The average herd size in the USA is 40 head. So these cattle are in little tiny herds, 20 here, 30 here, 40 there. There might be a herd of 100 but it's kind of the abnorm. There's all these little herds, but they produce a tremendous amount of cattle. All these people are doing something else for a living. They sell cars or a school teacher or a cattle dealer. I mean, they're a tractor dealer or something like that. So what my proposal is, is what we're gonna do is go around and collect cattle from all these little farms, 5,000. So we'll need 150 little farms feeding us 30, 40. Instead of putting it on a truck and going to the, to the feedlots, we're gonna put them on a truck and we're gonna take them to a big property in the Northeast, and we already have three properties of a thousand, thousand acres to 3,000 acres, and then we're gonna put them in a herd of 500 to 1,000 animals, and we're gonna graze them in the Northeast. <laughs> so just quickly, to go into the, you go into the store, grass-fed beef's already a category, it's, uh, it's in Kroger's, it's Target, Costco, you can buy it anywhere. It's the top of the market, but guess what? Most of this product's coming from Uruguay and Australia because there's not the supply in the U.S. The market is established. We just aren't playing. And this is the one that I, I put up to deal with price. Everybody says, oh, your meat costs so much. Well, there's, <laughs> there's the numbers, folks. 
A Snicker bar costs 92 cents an ounce. My meat's only 44 cents an ounce. And one of them is good for you. I'll let you guess which one. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, want to, I want to close with one more question, and it's kind of a general question. You know, how many, how many of you folks are involved in farming? That's what I'd like to know. And I'd like to say um, that I guess I'm not quite at the end, but I'll go to the end. This is another thing we're doing is grazing in the wintertime um, in New England. I did a SARE grant, and what we found was that the grass that we left in the field, that we stockpiled piled in July and went back and ate in November, December, January, and February, was at higher feed value than the hay bale and the wrapped baleage that we tested. There's the facts. <laughs> and the cattle prefer what's out in the field. And then if you begin to look at the cost difference between mowing it, baling it, putting it in the barn, taking it out of the barn, taking it back to the cattle, or going out in the wintertime and moving a wire, it's just like night and day. Uh, yeah, and I didn't talk about this. This is one of the big, big problems with grass-fed beef today is the quality. Now, there's many people that tried grass-fed beef and they say, I know I should eat it because it's the right thing, we can save the planet, but geez, I can't choke it down. It's tough, it's unpalatable, it's not tasty, and we understand that. But we also understand that if we can harvest the energy from the grass, that we can make a piece of meat that's phenomenal. This is um, Dan Barber who runs the stone Blue Hills at Stone Barns in Manhattan. He had in the Blue Hill in Manhattan. Pretty famous chef, and really embraced the farm to the table movement. And you know, I said to him, Dan, can I send you some steaks? Can I send you some steaks? He said, Nah, nah, nah. You're you're in North Carolina. We can't do that. And finally, I prevailed on him. He said, Okay, I'll try it. And this was what he said. He said it, the beef was unbelievable, among the best I've ever had. Just stood around amazed at the fat and the long persistence of taste. We're amazed, we gotta get some of this beef. So that's the potential if the grass-fed beef is raised correctly and finished correctly, we can just blow these chefs out of the water and all of us. And it's not more expensive, it's just a different management system. So this is where I was going when I asked you if you were involved in farming. My contention is that eating is an agricultural act. We are all involved in farming. And every choice that you make when you go in and spend your money reverberates right back to the farm. And so many people say, well, what can I do? And I say, go into your, where you buy your meat, pound on the counter, and say, I want 100% grass-fed beef, not sort of, kind of, almost grass-fed beef, um, because there's a lot of beef out there that, it's all grass-fed to a point, until it goes to the feedlot. And there's many people that will try and put up the smoke and mirrors. And my feeling is it's gotta be 100% grass, um, that there's no window, um, to have anything less than 100% grass. Um, I, I equate it actually to pregnancy. You know, you can't be almost pregnant or sort of pregnant or almost grass-fed. You, you either are, are or not, it's black and white. But if you insist on that, then that is gonna pull on the rope, it's gonna build the supply, and it's gonna mean all of a sudden, all these acres are gonna go out of corn and back into grass. Believe me, the marketplace uh, will get this. So anyway, that's where you can reach me. Go visit our website. We have a lot of, the, a lot of good stuff on the website.